Okay, so Hal talked about kind of um, some of the benefits to the approach, approaches that we've taken. And so I'm going to go into a little more of the nitty gritty details and, of course, the uh, trade offs and benefits of how you achieve it, right? There's always um, drawbacks, there's always advantages in computer architecture. And it's never always sunny day. And so, what were the compromises that we made in order to achieve this? And, you know, I'm a, a self taught engineer, so I was kind of try to make uh, analogies to other things within computer science. Um, and so kind of the stuff I'd like to focus on is uh, how do you achieve this idea of transparent uh, data movement? And when I mean transparent data movement, I mean from the application's perspective. How do you reach that perpetual storage model where you're continuously adding new hardware of technology that may not have existed in which uh, the, the time you created the cluster, but how do your applications consume it in a non-disruptive manner? And again, doing that is hard. It's really hard. I mean, since the beginning of storage, there's never really, never really had to do that. Um, and again, how did we do it? <laughs> right? There's lots of people who tried to do this. Why, are we, why were we successful from an architecture perspective? And of course, why does it matter from customer? And um, what were the requirements? And how does, it, uh, how does it work? So not to spend too much time on this, but I want to give just a little more background. Hal kind of touched on this, but again, going back to the very beginning of storage, um, every time you wanted to upgrade different storage platforms, whether it was media types or generations of hardware, uh, it always became the customer's problem, right? And over time, people have changed applications to make that less of an issue, or people have created you know, virtual machine environments so they can do live via migration to kind of deal with this bug, right? But it's a huge problem. And uh, especially when it comes to having to guess what you think you need, right? I mean, traditionally in the storage world, this is kind of on the order of three to five years. And that's almost impossible to do. And these days, considering how fa uh, f fast that flash is being revved, by the time it actually gets into the channel and by the time that, let's say, a third party actually verifies it, it's almost going to be EOL by then. So it's very difficult to actually get to the point where a customer is being able to consume new media technologies um, before you can't even buy it anymore. Which basically means the operational model is poorly, su poorly suited for consuming new technology, right? And kind of defeats the whole purpose. And even worse, in traditional storage, you're tailoring specific media to specific applications, which means your data's in silos. And of course, if you need to have uh, data across silos, it means it's your problem. Again, it's always the customer's problem. And it makes it extremely painful. And you can always tell, I mean, you know, at Deterra we do lots and lots of POCs. For tier one storage, if people are gonna bet the farm on your technology, they spend months and months and months making sure that it works before they actually put it in production. And it's interesting to see the, the kind of uh, differences in mentality between traditional storage folks and, let's say, people who come from more in operations and a cloud background. Storage people, you know, once they get our, our system, will provision, let's say, a dozen volumes, big volumes. They'll hook up VMware to it, and they never touch the system again. Versus someone who comes from a cloud mindset where you're creating and deleting 100 volumes a day. Right? So this idea that storage is holy, and there's only a few people who are allowed to touch it, versus it being dynamic and people are you know, provisioning resources on their own, kind of a normal cloud environment. And so those two things are at odds, right? They're always at, at odds. But how is it possible to, to achieve those? And so here's a good uh, comparison. Live VM migration, right? Now, in the x86 hypervisor world, uh, let's just say this has been done across multiple vendors now for almost a decade, right? ESX kind of popularized it, but in the open source world, Microsoft, people have done this. And essentially, what it comes down to is you have to future-proof the software layer above the hardware. So as you migrate virtual machines across nodes, you have that common set, uh, both from an instruction level at the CPU side as well as from the device level, right? And um, it's great. And you know, over time, Intel has continuously optimized different features within the platform to be able to do that better, right? It started out that everything was done in software, and then eventually they added some hardware bits to be able to say, you know, 
don't break out of the, the VM control structure between uh, root and non-root mode when you're servicing I.O., right? A lot more efficient for I.O. into virtual machines. And then they did the same for um, being able to track modifications across pages when you're doing live migration, right? So all this stuff that, you know, the, the end result is that you get a, uh, a vendor-independent future-proof model that allows you to move technology across generations of hardware. Great for everybody, right? How would you apply that same model to, to data storage? Essentially, how do you always have the software-defined system be able to do that transparent migration across generations of hardware, but not just the function to do that at an architectural level? How do you have that policy to automate that? So it's not a manual, you know, there's not an admin sitting behind the scenes making changes to that map. You define the end goal of what you want, and the system gives it to you. And so really kind of what the architecture pillars that are necessary to build that type of model, that future-proof model for data, similar to what people have solved on the virtual machine side. Now, when we started out this, uh, this venture five plus years ago, here's kind of the requirements that we saw. And don't have to spend a ton of time on this, but it's kind of important to understand uh, you know, what we, we saw as kind of the, the requirements, the, the minimum requirements. And of course, it means it needs to work on commodity white boxes, right? Traditionally in storage, it's very specialized hardware. But in the cloud world, we're talking about the lamest commodity boxes you can find, right? No special hardware. And of course, the system had to be able to uh, be easily ported across multiple vendors' platforms, right? I mean, in the open source world, in Linux, that's pretty much a, a solved problem these days. And of course, we need to be able to support node types of uh, both storage that exist today, as well as media that may exist years down the road, because we want to be able to consume that non-disruptively on the fly after a customer gets a cluster into production. Another important one is on the networking side. Uh, it has to work across standard TCP. And our system couldn't define the, what the network looked like. I mean, in a lot of these big customers, the network is already defined. And so we couldn't say, you know, you need to have you know, an L2 domain per rack. You need to have a leaf spine architecture with top of rack switches of this vendor. We didn't have that luxury. And so we had to fit in with what was there. So it had to work over standard TCP IP and fit into any type of networking environment that um, the customer already had. And another important requirement was it had to be able to work across multiple physical data center locations, something we call a stretch cluster, right? Another important requirement was on the host side, uh, customers generally are averse to having it to install a special driver to hook up to their storage. So it has to work out of the box with you know, every version of Linux, every version of Windows, every version of ESX, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, from an architecture perspective, you know, this idea of the placement maps, the things that reference the distributed placement of storage across nodes within the cluster, the modification of that had to be a core function, right? That it's something that always happens all the time. And this is where a number of the initial software-defined implementations fell very short. They chose an approach of making the placement mechanism very simple. But when you wanted to make modifications to it, um, you had to take the system offline. Or, you know, it was very difficult to handle multi-order failures when you were making those changes. And so the idea was we, you know, let's say we ate the extra complexity for the benefit of being able to always have the system capable of change when it came to how the data was laid out for an individual volume. And now that we has that, have that wonderful function, or that we, we wanted it when we started, uh, it has to be driven by autonomous application intent. And again, this is just you know, outcome-based storage. Much like a self-driving car, where you say, I want to go to, if you're in the Bay Area, San Francisco International Airport, and the car determines whether you take 101 or 280. It doesn't matter. There's an accident, it reroutes you. You can take a nap, right? And so getting to that point of the modification, the changes of the storage 
driven by that application intent. And as Hal mentioned, the idea of defining application requirements and storage has been around for a long time. But what's new is the ability to retroactively go back while the system is running and non-disruptively say, instead of uh, placement on all hybrid nodes, I want an all flash copy. Or maybe instead of a snapshot policy for every hour, I need it every 30 minutes. So the idea that you can always go back, make changes to the end destination, and the system gives it to you, uh, assuming that the hardware resources are there. Right. Uh, no? Ah, there we go. Few more requirements. So again, we always need to be able to add uh, new hardware. And this is also another one of the limitations of the early SDS was that the, when you created the cluster, uh, as you added new nodes, it had to be of the same hardware type, right? And not just from an x86 platform perspective, right? It had to be the same two socket system, broadwell CPUs, same memory, but also the same storage types. And so, if you're gonna run a cluster for five years or 10 years, that's very difficult because these days, especially media gets EOL very quickly and every year we have a new server platform or an improved server platform from Intel. And so only the largest customers in the world had enough financial resources to say, keep all of those parts around for the duration for the life of the cluster. And so what we saw was we wanted that same type of scale out design, but it had to be with asymmetric server and storage across multiple vendors. Another important requirement was um, you know, rolling upgrade has to be a fundamental function of the system. And most, more importantly than that, all of the different type of failure cases, whether it's a component failure, whether it's a full node failure, whether it's a network port failure, during rolling upgrade had to be handled the same way. This goes back to what Hal mentioned about the operational risk in these systems. In a lot of traditional storage systems, the upgrade path is the least tested path because it's only run once every two years. And unfortunately, in the, in the field, uh, upgrade is the time when a lot of other things tend to fail for unexpected reasons. And so we couldn't have all these special you know, code pass that only get executed, you know, in this, what we call fingers crossed events, right? And so it had to be a common code base where all different types of failures were handled the same in the upgrade path as well as in the normal IO path. And of course, in a self-service system, uh, multi-tenancy, uh, you know, is really built in at multiple levels, both at the network infrastructure level where we can do segmentation, um, where, I, uh, where tenants provision services from different IP pools associated with the VLAN tag so we could get that physical isolation at the network level, um, but also at the storage level. So say we can take a system and use data placement on a subset of the nodes tied to an individual tenant. And in mo the modern world, you know, so much of the provisioning is done through computer orchestration frameworks, right? And so the idea of a self-service API with API and REST, and um, you know, kind of the difference that you see in the marketplace is, uh, you know, with traditional systems where someone's put a REST interface on top of it versus a little more modern system uh, is the rate of change, right? So again, in traditional storage systems where you they were holy and you had a couple people who occasionally went in and touched a few CLI commands. Uh, it's not built for handling 500 rest, rest requests a day. And so that's where a lot of the traditional systems fall short and where, uh, from the Deterra side, our requirements were we had to be able to provision you know, hundreds of volumes uh, across multiple tenants, across multiple application instances, and have all that stuff just work. And of course, native plugins for all the you know, popular environments, both the more traditional ones with ESX and some of the more modern ones with OpenStack and containers, et cetera. And so what it essentially comes down to is that you have to make that idea of transparent data movement across all host environments, across generations of server and hardware, um, a core function. And it has to be driven by this outcome-based uh, application intent. And if you can actually achieve that, if you can make the architectural compromises within a system, 
it completely eliminates this idea of manual data migration across upgrade of server, uh, completely eliminates manual data migration across change to media type, and it completely throws out the requirement that you have to know what you need up front. And being able to elimin eliminate those as operational you know, problems, that's a really big deal in storage because the cost of being wrong uh, is extremely high in traditional storage systems when you have to buy everything up front. If you buy too much, you have to eat it. If you don't buy enough, you have to eat it. It's always your problem for being wrong. And so if we could build an architecture like this, this is you know, the problems we get rid of, and we get to this you know, future-proof architecture similar to what VM Live Migration has. Everybody's happy. So how do you actually do this? So the three core pillars of the system, and from, let's say, an architectural perspective, from a data perspective, is this idea of a current and a future map for volume placement. And really, a lot of it involves you know, the logical decoupling of the, the fast path I.O., the I.O. that's coming from the host, versus the data movement and the data migration in the background. Creating a system where those two things can happen in parallel. And to do this, you need to have a method to reprogram those fast path I.O. Uh, without service interruption, right? There could be some impact on performance as you're migrating data between multiple tiers across multiple media types, but you have to be able to continuously service I.O. And one of the interesting mechanisms we use to do this is this idea of a one-pass mesh rebuild mechanism. And so this is similar to, um, I guess, mesh, mesh networking in, in some respects. Now, we're able to rebuild from all available copies to a destination. So it's not so much that you're copying data from one location to another, but you're looking at all available copies and then breaking it up into multiple segments. So a mesh rebuild or a swarm rebuild, if you will. And Hal mentioned about our control plane. So we have a symmetric control plane where all metadata from a distributed placement perspective lives in memory on all nodes, and then it reprograms the fast path on the fly. So all metadata for the entire cluster lives on every node? From a distributed perspective. Now, let's say for a single volume, we're talking on the granularity of, let's just say, 16 gigabytes. So in the 16 gigabyte range, we have these UUIDs for these servers in this particular state. Now, each individual write also has metadata associated with it, but that only lives on the replicas for the individual servers. And so in the context of the, the level of metadata at the distributed level, you know, we're talking about in you know, single digit petabyte systems, hundreds of thousands of these 16 gigabyte spans that we have to track. And in terms of memory consumption, you know, we're talking a few K each. I didn't say it was a bad thing, I was just asking if that's what you Yeah. Said. So the, the vast majority of the metadata is in the per write metadata. Um, so it's probably, I would say, you know, probably an 80, 20 difference between the per write metadata that's kept on the replica nodes versus the distributed metadata that's kept in all nodes on the system. What's your CPU overhead? For which part? Uh, for keeping track of all of that on a per node. Um, so the, on this distributed side, and this uh, kind of begins to touch on the lockless, mo uh, lockless, mo uh, lockless memory coherency protocol, is that the lookup on the distributed level is very low. I mean, essentially, you're just taking an LBA offset and pointing it into one of these, these 16 gigabyte spans. And then within this span, finding the associated server UUID to write the replicas do. Now, on the, the per extent side, uh, that is much more significant because for every 4K write, you have an additional um, 256 bits of metadata associated with this timestamp. So, you know, the idea of being able to reprogram FastPath IO, that gives a tremendous amount of flexibility, right? But the performance, how do you, you know, have the flexibility without compromising the performance? And this is where we have this uh, lockless memory coherency protocol. And this is actually one of the most novel aspects of the system. And this was actually designed by a, uh, a CPU architect who create, who's created x86 cores and ARM cores. 
And so it works very much like a CPU pipeline in the sense that operations can happen out of order, but they're executed in time order down to the underlying storage. And so what this means is every single write has enough metadata to resolve the coherency at a distributed level, right? In a number of traditional storage systems and traditional cluster file systems, you have specialized nodes that keep track of you know, which, I, which writer owns which range on a particular piece of storage. And that's complex because you have to take multiple networks hops, you have to handle failure cases where nodes go away, maybe one node has to preempt another node in terms of write access. And so if you're having to do that, it's very difficult to maintain good performance because you're having to talk to so many nodes, so many memory accesses across multiple machines. Which means that in our system, every write has an augmented timestamp associated with it. And this allows us, again, to resolve distributed coherency without the use, without the use of a, a, a distributed lock manager. Now, in order to keep it extremely low latency, all of the acknowledgments to the host are done from byte addressable persistent memory. And when we mean persistent memory, we mean an NVDIM or a NAND back NVDIM or an NVRAM card. Now, this means that the host only sees the latency associated with the network hops for the number of replicas, touching the NVDIM, and the acknowledgment back. So this is where you can get on the order of, you know, let's say 150 microsecond sustained latency, which is uh, very, very good in the storage world. It also means that our write latency isn't tied to a particular media type, right? Because most flash, especially the higher end NVMe flash, has a little bit of faster memory than flash fronting it. And so writes are acknowledged from that. But over time, as you use flash, it begins to wear, and you get unpredictable performance. And so because this system always acknowledges from NVDIM and VRAM, um, we get good consistent latency independent of what media is actually behind it. That's one, one big benefit. The second one is that as we destage from this persistent memory down to the underlying flash, we're able to send it down in one megabyte sized writes. So even if the host, like a database, for example, is generating a bunch of small writes, we're sending those down as one megabyte writes to the underlying media. And one of the important things when it comes to interaction with Flash is that if you're sending down a number of small block writes, it's constantly having to do a read modify write across the erase units. So even though you send down 4K, it's having to read back one megabyte, write one megabyte. So when you do this over years and years, the flash begins to wear down. You have extra reserve sectors in the media. Um, but you get this you know, variable performance and latency. And so not only in our design do we have the benefit of acknowledging directly from persistent memory, we're able to send down those nice erased unit size writes, which means over the years, we get very good long running performance and endurance on flash because we're not constantly sending down small block writes. You have the ability to have variable size, or like it's in different, let's say tomorrow a new media comes out with, I don't know, 64 gig cells. That's right. So it's still a little tricky to, because there's not really a standardized way that that metadata is exposed to the hosts. So a lot of it is, you know, getting the NDAs in place and talking with the FDL teams from the different vendors to understand what the right alignment is. Um, but that's what, what part of the, the exercise is really understanding that and tuning it into a specific vendor type. And that can vary across different product lines and even different versions of the, uh, uh, the flash media itself. And so that is um, one area where a number of people fall behind, where they optimize, say, the network transport in their storage system, but they're still tied by the media latency itself. And so in some cases, for example, when we're out in the field, uh, there are companies who have extremely fast specialized networking transports. But we still beat them on performance and latency over standard TCP IP, and everybody wonders why that is. It's because we're acknowledging from persistent memory and not tied by the media latency, right? So kind of the best of both worlds. 
Uh, it, yes. A question on that media choice. So the NVDIM and non-volatile RAM stuff, it, would you consider that to be commodity storage? Like, How do you define it as that's a fair. commodity storage? Like? That's fair. So I would say that's the one piece that maybe isn't quite commodity white box. Uh, on the Skylake platforms from Dell, from Supermicro, from HP, you can get OEM NVDIMs. Mm -hmm. Previous to Skylake, it was usually a third-party part and a BIOS modification to make that work. So I think it's fair to say that of the components that we utilize within the individual nodes, that persistent memory isn't quite a commodity component yet. Mm -hmm. Now, Intel you know, is productizing their new 3D crosspoint memory into a dim form factor for the Cascade Lake parts this year. And so you'll have persistent byte addressable memory using 3D crosspoint directly from Intel. So we're also looking at utilizing that as a replacement for NVDIM and NVRAM, but it's still unclear ultimately what the endurance of those parts will be. And so we've done some work too to be able to run on non-byte addressable media for that first phase acknowledgement, but there is a performance impact on that. But again, for most of the folks we talk to, if they're going from Dell, from Supermicro, from HP, you can get those parts directly from them for the last 12 months or so. Mm -hmm. And so that last part for the memory, uh, the memory protocol is, you know, that host acknowledgement from the persistent memory happens, but all of the efficiency algorithms and encryption happens in the second phase of the two-phase write. So again, the host only sees the latency associated with the number of network hops for the replicas defined by those placement maps, and everything else is done behind the scenes post-acknowledgement. And so that gives you the best of both worlds, where you get the flexibility and the economics of the efficiency algorithms, but without sacrificing performance and latency people expect. And then, of course, the third one, and uh, it's been highlighted a few times, is that um, you define application templates. And tenants provision from templates into instances. And the instances contain all of the things related to the access and the consumption of the data. This can be from number of volumes to the placement policy of those volumes, to the snapshot policy, to the replication policy, to the access VIPs, to the service type, um, whether they're shared across multiple tenants, all that great stuff. So there is that additional upfront requirement of having to define your application requirements, but then you get the great benefit of being able to make changes. So, you know, the modern orchestration frameworks like Kubernetes, they're really built with that in mind. VMware, it's kind of been an afterthought, right? The idea that, you know, VMware started with what we call infrastructure-centric uh, infrastructure. The idea that you're working with volumes, but not with applications. And so VMware's kind of grafted, retrofitted their architecture to make that possible, but it's still a little bit... Um, you know, it, it still it can be a stretch in some cases. And so our system can had to work out of the box with the label-based provisioning for the modern orchestration frameworks, but also fit with what was there. So I think we have a little visual representation here. So this is talking about the, uh, the application templates. So here we have an example of a MySQL template, right? And again, access methods, media placement, tenancy, all the good stuff. And so we start out with this one, let's say, that we define com comes as part of the initial product. And here we have a, a quick view of the tenants, right? Top level root tenant, subdivision into Coke and Pepsi, and below Coke and Pepsi, we have different divisions within each tenant. Now, as you provi provision from the application template, let's say in the case of a dev environment, um, all flash placement is overkill. So we're going to go with hybrid placement. Then for production with Coke, that default template looks good, right? And then we go to another subtenant. They're going to create their own policy for dev. Let's say they don't want all flash placement, they want all Optane placement, because you know, lowest latency possible. And then the production side, they make a modification to the base policy. Now, the real magic of this is that for the Subtenants associated with the base policy. You make a change to the top level template, it affects all of the running instances. 
And so it's not that, you know, when you provision from these templates and you guess wrong about what you need, you have to go back to each provision instance manually changing them. You just change the top level policy. It affects all of the tenants that have provisioned instances from that top level policy. But at the same time, it still allows individual tenants to have customized view of those templates if they want to make local modifications. And what if those conflict? Or you're not allowed to create one that conflicts? Well, that's, so that goes from a bound instance yeah. to an unbound instance. Yeah, so right. a, a template that's specific to that one individual tenant where they can make those lo local modifications. But by default, all of the tenants, the uh, templates are bound okay. until yep. someone explicitly detaches yep. them and makes it, it a, a unique snowflake, Exactly. If you will. So um, it sounds like these are less templates than they are defined states or something like that, because normally I think of template as just at creation time. Mm -hmm. But then if I update the template, normally I wouldn't expect. Yeah, it has so a I'm, dependency. I'm questioning the terminology. That's fair not to say. That's fair to say. Um, yeah. You're right. I think the, the, the word template certainly has connotations, it's especially. It's a model or it's a defined state. Yeah. Defined state is the, yeah. the words that I would put there because hmm. they're new. <laughs> Model's an old term, but it, it really sounds like like the whole time you were talking about templates, in my mind, I was processed until you said, if I make a change to the template, then it applies it's like everywhere. A policy, and it's either bound policy or unbound policy. Yeah. Yeah, maybe policy is a better term here. I think yeah. template has kind of a, yeah. Yeah, a, 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 a mid 90s connotation. It's so, but it's also <laughs> only usually thought of at creation time. I see. Usually, yeah. And it's really more of a model. I yeah. think. So, the template yeah. you stamp out, and then it's not. Yeah. Bound yeah. I have a template. question on your snapshot. So, so you, yes. you're doing snapshots within the storage itself. I'm, like in this policy, you're saying hourly. So, this not, your, your storage is going to cut a snapshot at the storage level. Yes. And you're talking about block here because it's iSCSI, right? That's right. Yep. We can have unacknowledged rights at the host. Are you calling back to the host to get it to quiesce its file system before you're doing that? No. So the, we do not have plugins on the host side like VSS, which gets a file system in a consistent state before <laughs> it takes a snapshot file, right? in an individual volume. So we have, uh, we call it, uh, uh, we have consistency groups. So you can say have multiple instances provisioned from the template in a snapshot consistency group. And then when we take the snapshot on the back end, we can ensure using that time-based protocol that each of the volumes in that consistency group, uh, a snapshot occurs at the same time. So yeah, it's still, not consistent still subject to from the FSCK, host though. perspective. You're still subject to FSCK in the, within the file system. That's time. right. So, so it's not uh, quiesced on the host side, but we at least can ensure that from uh, a timestamp perspective, all of the rights are barriered across all the volumes. But you have an API that time. can cut a snap manually, so I can cut something at the, at the, at the container host level that can say, hey, I'm going to just quiesce. Right. Put myself in a backup mode, call date Terra, say boom. That's right. I snap, right? I mean, and so, you know, I mean, I think Microsoft is the only one who's actually standardized doing that on the host side. Oracle Most of the other years. ones are application specific. Yeah, we'll be doing um, but that's that's something that uh, we haven't haven't focused on just yet. Because that gets out of the policy. That's right. But no what free lunch. So, so what is yes. the smallest unit you can take a snapshot of? I mean, is it file? Is it a volume? Oh, uh, a single volume. Okay. So both in terms of the a block export to the host with iSCSI or the uh, S3 object to the host, it's both block underneath on the Deterra side. Um, so it really comes down to an individual uh, volume. Okay. Mm. I yeah. have a question back on the template policy thing, um, which is partly about the humans who are operating this because you've, yes. you've said that, okay, so if I've got... You've already lost me. I have yeah. bound policy that will, if I change the policy, that will affect everything that's been provisioned from that template ever. Yes. Uh, many humans will become nervous by that because it's like, oh, if I do that, I might break all of them. Yeah. That's so right. So I'm going to be really smart and make sure that I can't accidentally break my whole fleet and I'm going to only create unbound templates so that yep. everything is a special <laughs> snowflake now. <laughs> yes, because they got burned on it once before. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's true. Because someone made an application specific That's right. Change. That's why my yep. database will always be laid out in this particular RAID configuration, Yeah. Um, even though we are now in 2019. So. Yes. How do you encourage customers yes. to stop using previous ways of operating their storage for something which is designed to be operated in a completely different way? That's a, that's a good question. So the safeguards involved with that are, um, you know, the uh, amount of, let's say, uh, space reserved for the, the transparent data movement versus the foreground I.O. 
is on the order of 15%. And so the modifications aren't immediately applied uh, to the running system. Uh, it happens over a long period of time. Mm. Now that is tunable in terms of how aggressive you want to make that migration, and also based upon the utilized capacity. Uh, if we see that you know a handful of nodes are at 90%, we'll aggressively migrate from those to begin with versus ones that are less utilized. Mm -hmm. And so the modification to state does play out over time. And so people can still change their mind even after they've changed their mind the first time. Yep. Um, there are some additional safeguards that we've been thinking about in terms of maybe only doing it for the first subset of instances. I was going to ask, do you have a canarying type mechanism so I can decide, you, know, you turn it well, on, it tries it on. I was going right. to ask yeah. if you had plug for the, the automation platforms like Shep and, yeah. and, well, and Terraform yes. and that kind of stuff so you could roll back and cookbook it. Or, yes. or yeah. a yeah. what if type thing. If exactly. I make this change, Ooh, I like how will it change each, I'll call it a node, each node in this hierarchy. Like that's, mm -hmm. I, yeah. more yeah. so, I mean, I yeah. like this idea of, oops, mm -hmm. let's roll back. Mm -hmm. But for me, I want that knowledge first. Like yes. if I change this to this, mm -hmm. what's gonna ripple down mm -hmm. and, and how is each one gonna change? And then a, a diff of each of those. And that'll help me learn how to operate my platform better. Yeah. So the humans will get smarter over time. Yeah. Yes, and so the analytics gives uh, a pretty big part of that today in terms of say, um, you know, a simple case we see in the field is where a customer starts out who's cost sensitive, so they have all hybrid nodes, flash and disk. Mm. And through analytics we can say, okay, 10% of your capacity is missing into hard drives 90% of the time. And so this would be a case where we add one all flash node and just make changes to the policy, or rather those, those unbound instances now, um, and make changes to those specific instances to say put one copy flash on um, those volumes that actually need it, mm. right? And this kind of how touched on this is the ability to pinpoint technology consumption versus just adding a whole new tier and not really understanding who, who would benefit most from consuming it. Yeah. I, are, yeah. you, are you able to help people undo their special snowflakeness as well? I was like, <laughs> I've realized the error of my ways. I, that was stupid. I shouldn't have done that. I would like to go and apply one master template to all of them now, please. Can you, can you do that? Uh, th and, that still undo. takes a little bit of massaging from the <laughs> API side, so that part isn't fully automated. I don't think in the field we've had that request, but I could see that, see that happening. It's, it's more of a forward. And, that, what, so, and yeah. calling those templates defined states and then being able to constantly measure what they've been set to is usually the way modern deployments are yeah, and wanting so, to work. And so our system's at the level where you know customers or we will look at the analytics and make those recommendations. We haven't got to the point where, say, those are oh, yeah. automatically offered up to the customer yeah. saying, no. we noticed this. Would you like to make this improvement? Yeah. Would, we like to, would you like to automatically buy a flash node? But that's kind of <laughs> the next stage now that we have these basic primitives. And I, yeah, I can see yeah. that as a support thing. We yeah. like, uh, hi, I've, you know, like Clippy pops up and says, hi, it looks like you're trying to <laughs> Bob, do something stupid. Yeah, Bob. Well, yeah, but I hope we do something making, better. Making <laughs> well, you don't know everyone's behavior. Making actual items isn't necessarily great because if someone's doing something, no, I don't want. I don't want actual mods. Yeah. I want the the so, information presented to them. Yeah, yeah. So, that, that's my right. quick question on the on the change on the app template. Side. Yes. So clearly, you're doing dependency mapping all the way down in order to be able to understand impacts of doing the change. What sort of uh, what sort of uh, I haven't seen your UI. I don't understand how, yeah. how the interface yeah. works. So what what exactly? What's the feedback that says, hey, I want to go change my app template, but Actually, it's not possible to provision sure. the change. So what, by, what is that interaction, and do you make other recommendations based off of what they're trying to do? Yeah. So by default, it is best effort provisioning. So for example, you could go into one of these templates and say, I wanted a one-way flash replica policy, even if the system didn't have one-way flash or a flash node available. So we do allow them, uh, customers by default, to define the end state, even if the hardware in the system isn't available at the time. Now, that is a configurable thing. We can do strict provisioning where whatever you ask for, you have to have. But by default, that will complete the request but generate a warning in the fault log saying, we completed this request, but you don't actually have the hardware. But the beautiful thing is that once you do have the hardware, that, or that, that part is fully autonomous from there. It will automatically rebalance without doing anything after the hardware is added. 
So what sort of indication besides just a log entry that you aren't actually getting the behavior that you dictated? <laughs> Right. Uh, to, today, we, we again best uh, best pra or, uh, uh, best effort by default. So other than the log warning, it's it's up to the administrator to to know that. Okay, so don't be stupid and shoot yourself in the foot. Is basically <laughs> I mean, common yeah. sense principle always so, applies. So so, 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 with that. So, so sorry, folks. I have so much more wonderful animations, but uh, we have to move on. So. So uh, there are a couple of questions probably I can answer. I initially, when I came in, I designed a lot of stuff um, uh, with, with respect to how the templates are handled and how do a customer really know that the changes they have applied are actually in place. Right. So what we call them is a, you know, what an administrate is, like what an administration, administrator really wants, and what is, what is the operational state of the system. So we maintain two things. Wide, widely across the entire spectrum in the, in the system, which basically says, okay, this is the change you want to make, and by whatever the resources available to you, whether I was able to make that change or not. So it means the operational state would always say that am I matching your administrative state? So you have a, if you have a differentiation between these two, you would upfront know, okay, the change that you wanted to apply are not applied right now. So that's, that's, a, that's a fundamental behavior built in the system across everything, whether it's a change in a policy, whether it's a change in a template, or whether it's a change in the resources underneath. If a flash node gets decommissioned and a lot of copies are placed on flash node, and you've been said as best effort basis that my media should be placed, my data should be placed on flash node, the system will upfront tell you, okay, hey, by you, I got rid of a flash node, and you're, these are the five app instances which actually were requiring flash placement. So I will start marking them yellow and saying, okay, hey, the data is still available, but it is not what actually you were asking in the beginning with. So it's not going to make the service level agreement that I have, performance, availability, whatever you determine is the important criteria within your template, then it's going to flag it for you. That's, okay. That's right. Okay. That's right. So system is built on the two principles, what Nick and Hal mentioned. <clears throat> so um, you always can specify the enforcement criteria, how strictly you want to enforce certain things. If you do not like something and you do not want to go ahead, if the resources are not there, it will immediately flag. It will basically tell you, OK, no, you cannot do this. Even if a template which basically carries the changes wide across all the app instances, it gets very difficult for people to know, okay, how many app instances will be impacted by this change. So what we are building is something as an estimate impact, that's a what if, yeah. which basically can tell you upfront, by making this change, what will be changing in your system before you actually go ahead and decide to make the change. But of course, since the data placement in underneath layer is so dynamic, it gets difficult sometimes to give every granular change in the system, which will basically you know, confuse more people out. But basically, a top-level state can always be percolated up and tell, OK, this is what is happening with respect to your change. Uh, so along those lines, uh, if I have something that's completely non-negotiable, like there must be encryption at all times, mm -hmm. can I set that and enforce it no matter if someone disconnects the policy? You want to take it? So the, the encryption setting is actually at a per-system level. And if a node attempts to join the system that is not capable of encryption, we will not let it join. So as we look okay. at, as, yeah, as we look at the, uh, you know, what policies mean across the system, we've we've thought about all these things. We've encoded them uh, for what makes sense at the given level. So a lot of the uh, the things we talk about are per volume controls. Uh, so we've talked a lot about policy, so let me talk a little bit about that before we jump into the, the uh, um, modern data center uh, and the data center aware aspect of our, our technology. And great questions. This is fantastic, because this is the discussion that we want to have as a company. This is what we want to talk about. We, we sort of joke um, internally that the world does not need another storage platform. What <laughs> the world needs is data management. <laughs> so I'm you trying to find happy. my slides in the deck here. <laughs> you made me happy. Yes, yes, yes. So um, I believe this is me. I yeah, need to data center. So as you start thinking about, it, everyone here is familiar with storage. Like we have some kind of storage. If you think about all the questions that you need to answer to make that storage happen, every single one of those questions effectively becomes a policy. Name, not so much, but the size. In our system, that is actually a policy consideration because the numbers that you've typed into the control plane have absolutely nothing to do with what you physically have. So we support a 256 terabyte volume. From a, a logical perspective, we can map 
all of the components to make your application think it has 256 terabytes. You, you can do that on 100 terabytes of storage. So while the application is writing, you can add more nodes. We can redistribute those allocations based on actual capacities of those spans so that you can grow the system to meet that requirement. And, and there was a great question earlier about, um, uh, and sorry, I don't have everyone's names, uh, about how does administrators know that the system is not doing what they asked it to do? That is a critical aspect. And, and this take it back up to the, the top level requirement of a software defined or modern data center, you have to be able to audit. If you can't audit the infrastructure and you haven't built an audit process, what are you doing? Because as we start looking at, at these concepts of self-service and software defined and that, that whole infrastructure that happens to uh, get that agility, which is the ultimate business outcome we're trying to drive to, if you don't have an audit process, you will fail. And, and we see this across Amazon where that's sort of customers and in the cloud is where customers are first sort of experiencing these concepts of I've asked for something, did I actually get it? In, in the old world of, of ticketed IT, right, everyone remembers those days of, okay, I need a database server. And they're like, okay, where's your PO request? Because I've got to take that piece of paper and give it to procurement, who's going to give it to the vendor, who's going to go build it, and then they're going to ship it, and then we have to schedule the deployment, and 30 days, 90 days, 180 days later, here's your database server. That is just not acceptable anywhere. And so as, as you think about all of these processes and changes, that audit capability is critical. Our API provides the audit. You can ask for all the deployment details out of the API, and it'll tell you it's not satisfied. We set alerts on, on per volumes. We can set alerts on storage nodes, all of those capabilities, coupled with what Hal was talking about, that insights, that uh, external monitoring capability, so that it just provides extra processing power against that data with our uh, knowledge of the system. Because you know, we're experts. We know it better than, than anyone else. So we can use that to, to, to dig in. Okay?